Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And part 2. <coughs> Romans 12. read verse 6, or verse 5 and 6, and then we're going to go down to verse 15. So verse 5. So, er, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Now moving down to verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Father, please help us with your word this morning. We need alertness. We need comprehension. And God, we need a love. Lord, for those that would not be would not be open to the idea of their obligation to exercising their spiritual gifts in the church. Lord, would you break stubborn hearts? Would you break down barriers of pride? Would you break down resistance to your will? God, for those that would have difficulty understanding or maybe uh, be mentally struggling with the capacity this morning to even comprehend or focus. We ask for the help of your Holy Spirit to teach us all things. God, I pray for the preacher this morning that you would use him to be not preaching his message, but yours. We just ask that you bless the preaching of your word now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are now in the portion of Romans beginning in chapter 12 of application. <clears throat> in the end of chapter 15 or beginning in chapter 15 we'll see a conclusion with some final specific remarks both to individuals in the church at Rome as well as some just last statements or some kind of summary sort of statements. But right now we're privileged to be in that portion of Romans where we actually get to see well, what is the best that is we are in the best place to understand. I, I would say this about Romans. I like to use words like best and most sometimes, but oftentimes I'm careful about using those words to describe a particular portion of the Scripture. Let me illustrate for you what I'm talking about. Have you ever had, do you, does anyone here have a life verse? I have a life verse. Okay, so a couple people have life verse. I remember life verse was really popular when I was in college. I mean, everybody's a, Tell me your life verse. Sometimes in the uh, before in our prayer group, people would share their life verse and share a little testimony. And oftentimes a life verse would be maybe a verse of the Scripture that God used to kind of redirect them or to direct them. And uh, they kind of live by that verse. And all of us have that. I always struggled with that because I had so many. I just, you know, it's like it's the one I need this week, not the one I needed last month or last year. I... You know, God hasn't just dealt with me or led me once, so I've oftentimes had a hard time with that. 
And so when I hear preachers preach a passage of Scripture, and they say, this is the most important verse of the Scripture, or this is the best in the Scripture, I'm, I'm kind of careful about that. So the way I use that in, in Romans, though, would be that this is the portion of Romans that is the best place to understand how to live doctrine. In other words, I'll use the word best here, and I'll say that Romans 12 through the beginning of Romans chapter 15 is the best place to study to know how to live. To know how to live. All doctrine, what you believe, in, to some degree, in some way, affects what you do. What you believe affects what you do. And the truth of the matter is, is that this is the place then that we live out Romans. A lot of people want to talk about doctrine, 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 doctrine. And we should. We have a no sound doctrine. But doctrine isn't any good if it doesn't help you to do something to accomplish God's purpose in your life. And this is really the practical place. So last, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago, we saw the importance of spiritual gifts. Now I want to look, and I'm going to ask a question that I haven't asked for sake of time the last couple of weeks, but I have wanted to. And let's go back to uh, the beginning of our text this morning, chapter 12 and verse 4. The Bible says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Let me ask the question. When it says many members in one body, is it speaking to the saved church as a whole, or is it talking about the church at Rome? Well, Joel thinks it's the church at Rome. Tell us why. I don't think it's referring to, because the church is a local body of believers as opposed to a church universal. Here's the deal. Paul uses the word we, and he's never been to Rome. Okay? He uses the word we, but he's never been to Rome. Okay, so here's the, here's the thing. I've heard people say, well, you know, he used the word we, and he's never been to Rome. And it, Okay, that's worth considering, isn't it? In the English language. But here Paul is putting himself in the position of being part of the church. Let me ask you a question. What was Paul? An apostle. What's an apostle? Someone who has a direct relationship with God. Okay, the qualification for an apostle is to have a direct relationship with God. Okay, but what is an apostle? What? A sent one. He's a, okay, a disciple? No, a sent one. Oh, a sent one. Okay, an apostle is a sent one. Apostolos means to one who is sent or to send. The head of the church. Yeah, an apostle was a foundational gift of the church. So was Paul part of the church at Rome as an apostle? Absolutely he was. Okay, so here's the disingenuous game people make to try to say that Romans or passages of Scripture like this are talking to the church as a whole, but not to a church specifically. Well, you know, Paul wasn't part of that church. He'd never even been to Rome. Is that so? Is it so? It's so that he's never been to Rome. It's so that he's never been to Rome, but was he not part of the church at Rome? For crying out loud, he's an apostle. He's giving them their doctrinal statement right now. Yes, he was part of the church at Rome. So, see, when a person has a reason to believe what they believe, they have a reason to interpret the Scripture how they do. And here's what a lot of people don't believe in. They don't believe in church membership. They don't believe that it is a biblical requirement to join a church. Now, joining a church is a nebulous thing, right? I know churches that you have to go to a membership class to join. But uh, I'm talking about joining a church as in committing yourself to be part of the body. And the body knowing that you're committed. That's a pretty simple definition for join, isn't it? In other words, if you never say, I want to be part of this church, I want to be a member of this church, you're not really committed to it, are you? No. So people that don't believe in church membership, they just want to bop from place to place, or they don't want to be under the authority. They uh, they don't want to have... There's no church discipline if you're not a church member. You can't be disciplined out of a church that you're not a member of a church. So you don't want to be under a disciplinary authority. Or maybe you have a disagreement with something in the church, and so you want to maybe attend but not be a member of it. They love to take a passage of Scripture like this and say, well, you know, this is... 
you know, a general statement. No, it's actually not. When Paul says, uh, as being many members having one body, is he talking to, is he talking to, you know, hypothetical members of the body that are out there floating around uh, the world and all accomplishing the purpose of the, quote, universal church? He is not. He is tying together the means, the practical application for how the Jews and the Greeks at Rome can accomplish the ministry at Rome. So when he says members and having you know, many offices, when he makes those statements, understand this. So in verse 5, for verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. My friend, I want us to understand that this is a real, practical application that Paul is making. He's not saying, you know, go out there and you know use your spiritual gift to accomplish the work of God, but there's no cohesion or there's no belonging in the body. That's not what he's saying at all. He's speaking specifically about a body that's divided over being Jews and Greeks, and he's explained to them how that we're many members, we're one body, and all what we are is needs to we need to apply uh, what our spiritual gift is. And then he points out in verse six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. You need to get two weeks ago the message we preached two Sundays ago on spiritual gifts. You need to listen to it if you were not here. You need to listen to that message because you need to understand what a spiritual gift is and the importance of your exercising your spiritual gift. We made a lot of uh, application or points by way of application a couple of weeks ago that I think are breakthrough, if you'll understand it. But every believer needs to understand that God has given you grace for your body. And I'm not talking about your physical body or for your own benefit. I'm talking about the body of believers that you're called to serve with. And if you're not exercising that spiritual gift, you're literally, literally handicapping the body. Literally, instead of uh, being used as part of the body, are literally taking the body. If you're a leg, then it's a one-legged body. If you're an arm, then it's a one-armed body. Could be that there's two people that are arms and it's a no-armed body. If you're an eye, then you know it's, there's no eyes in the body. In other words, what we need to understand is the importance of our involvement with our spiritual gift in the body. Another thing that is important that we learn from looking at spiritual gifts is that there isn't anything anywhere in the Scripture that says that God gives you grace or a spiritual gift and that's the, that's the last that God says about it. In other words, my gift is giving or my gift is mercy or my gift is exhorting. And so that's what I'll always be. No, God gives you according to the needs of the body. And if the needs of the body change, God could change His grace in you. That's called spiritual growth. Something we did not emphasize a great deal but needs to be said is that God oftentimes does not limit a person to one spiritual gift. In other words, each of the gifts here are things that ought to be part of us all. I don't want to be excluded from the gift of giving. Do you? I don't want to be excluded from the gift of mercy. Do you? I don't want to be excluded from any of the spiritual gifts. I want to have a lot of them. Uh, Matter of fact, I've asked people that know me. Uh, because one of the best ways uh, to know what your spiritual gift is, go before the Lord and ask God what it is. But another way to know your spiritual gift is to ask people that know you. And so I've asked my wife, I've asked others, what are your spiritual gifts? And you know something? They've listed all of them. So these are all your spiritual gifts. And you go through uh, prophecy. Yes, I have the gift of a prophet. Uh, ministry. Uh, yes, teaching. Yes, my wife will tell you that the gift of teaching is something that when she first met me, I did not have. But it's something that God has developed in me. It's something that's, that is a gift that I now do have. And she's a teacher. She understands teaching. And so she'd tell you, yes. Uh, exhorting, yes. Giving, yes. Ruling, yes. Showing mercy, too much. Cheerfulness uh, with the mercy. Uh, love without dissimulation. Uh, abhor that which is evil, cleave that which is good. All these things. Uh, are now, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm talking about gifts, and then I've just started reading in verse 9, which begins 
the manner of how we should behave. Okay, everybody, wake up for a little bit, okay? I'm going to be done preaching in just a few minutes, so go ahead and come back. Come back, everybody. Come back, join us, and we're going to preach today's message. Last week, we began how to practice our spiritual gifts, how to behave. And the important thing here is for believers to understand that your background is important, Jew or Greek. Yeah, that's not what's important. What's important is how you act toward one another. And so we began a series of commands. We began to look at how we're supposed to behave. That was last week. And last week we ended in chapter 12 and verse, uh, in, in verse 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints given to hospitality. And so we looked at those things, and I'm not going to review them today because if you weren't here last week, you could go on YouTube and you could watch that message. And so here we are in verse 14. We're going to see a series of commands. Last week, though, the commands that we saw primarily were inside the church. In other words, how believers should act with each other. Now we're going to see that the commands are very general. That is, how we should act in general and, and oftentimes how we should act toward those that are without. And we get very specific about, about that in chapter 13 and verse 1 when we begin to see, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And so, let's go back, let's dial back and go to verse 14, and let's look at this series of commands. Okay, the Bible says, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. I'm going to step out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that this command ought to be at least a command about how we ought to respond to those that are without the church. In other words, it's a real tragedy, isn't it, if you're persecuted in the church? So we're going to say, or we're going to assume this morning, not because we're interpreting the Scripture our ways, but we're going to assume that the primarily persecution in the church comes from those that are outside of the church, right? Is it possible that you could be persecuted by brethren? I, I'm not eliminating the possibility. Uh, it certainly is more painful to be persecuted by brethren than it is to be persecuted by those that are without. It certainly hurts more when your family uh, are against you than the people that are without. But we see here a statement which reflects what Jesus Christ Himself taught in the Beatitudes when He said, "Blessed are, or bless." Um, I'm sorry. When He talks about blessings, and uh, blessed are those which hunger and thirst after righteousness. And so here in verse 14 we see, "Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not." Okay. When you're persecuted, what is the command then for believers? Bless, bless them. And then the Bible says, bless and curse not. Do you know something? There are many Christians who are in direct disobedience with the Scripture in this, in this instance. There are many Christians that when they come into opposition, they literally want the person who opposes them to have God's curse on them. And the Bible says about those that persecute us that we're supposed to bless them. It is not just a practice or a technique of winning people to bless those that persecute us. It's a reflection of the character of God. It's not just a technique. It's, it, is, it does make it more difficult when someone is kind to you to feel good about being hard on them, doesn't it? When somebody is, even if you don't agree with them, uh, it's more difficult to be hard on somebody if they're kind to you. You know, a lot of Christians, though, they they literally don't bless people that persecute them. How many lost people are for Jesus? None. Well, none. How many lost people are against Jesus? All of them. All of them. How many lost people are going to change their, their team? A lot. In other words, everyone used to be against Jesus, right? We were born the enemies of God. So, just remember this, persecutors, God's attitude toward one who persecutes a believer, which ultimately is to persecute him, God's attitude toward them is that he wants them to be saved. Sometimes our attitude is, how dare them oppose me, a representative of God. Right? God's attitude is, bless them. I love Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Don't you? For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. But God commended his love to, I said that wrong, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, I mixed two verses, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. 
I still messed it up. Yeah. <laughs> Christ died for us. Yeah, but God committed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, uh, Christ died for us. So what's God's attitude toward the lost? He loves them. He wants them saved. Is Christ's death on the cross a blessing beyond measure? Is it? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. So what part or what what part in Christ or the work of God does a believer who curses those who persecute them have? You're an absolute contradiction if you curse your persecutors. Okay? So that's settled, isn't it? Let's move on to the next one. The Bible says, Bless them that, that uh, or rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. And it means ex exactly what it says. If a believer or a lost person rejoices, rejoice with them. It's just evil when a believer does not want God's blessing for someone else or covets or is jealous of God's blessing for someone else, isn't it? Isn't it just evil? It's amazing how often time we bring ourselves into a conversation that has nothing to do with us. I find myself doing it all the time, and I find uh, when I listen that other people do it as often as I do. It's amazing when you talk how often we try to find something to relate to somebody so we can tell about what we think about it or what, uh, or in conversation, not just telling what we think, but just telling about something about us that's similar to theirs. Somebody has a new car, go look at their new car and admire it and just be happy for them. And don't think about your car. Somebody has a possession, a house, or, uh, or you know, a uh, Fitbit on their wrist, or whatever it is, look at the thing and admire it and be happy that they have it. Glad you have that. You know? Well, you know something I think shouldn't be that important to people. You ever heard that? You know? You're jealous. You think that they shouldn't have something you don't have. You say, well, they can't afford it, you know, and they bought it anyway. Well, maybe that's so. Maybe that's so, but what does that have to do with your rejoicing with them that rejoice? In other words, the attitude that a believer has for another believer is to rejoice with them. Glad that this has happened with you. Something good happens in somebody's life. Uh, don't begrudge them of it. Man, I'll just tell you something. I've gotten to the place, thank God, that... Uh, I recognize that this is so true that it's really helped me in a lot of ways to rejoice with people. Not just think about your lack, but think about how good it is that somebody has gotten something. Here's a tough one. You're single. Somebody else gets in a relationship. They're going to get married. I see this all the time. I see all the time people won't rejoice for someone else. It's like another one bites the dust, you know. Yeah. Another holdout goner. When I was in high school, uh, it was we weren't the inventors of it, but we were pressured to go to our church Valentine's banquet with a the date. They they didn't want us to date, but then they wanted us to take dates to the Valentine's banquet. It was a serious contradiction. And so I started a group, the Bachelors Till the Rapture. Amen. You know, I didn't make it. I also got my hair cut before Luke too. So I just sometimes I just can't hold out. I, you know, like succumb uh, to God's will. But the reality of it is, is that, you know, somebody, if God gives someone someone special, rejoice with them that rejoice. Don't think about, you know, I'm going to be all alone. Not only, not only is that brother going to get married, but now I've lost a friend. You know, I mean, he's not going to be able to have time for me anymore. Not only is that sister going to get married, but now she's going to treat me differently. She's not going to have time. Now rejoice with them that rejoice, the Bible says. That's great, isn't it? Hey, that's not, that's not optional. That's a, that is a biblical scriptural command and you are not living out what the Bible teaches unless you obey it. You're disobedient to the scripture and uh, you're not living what the scripture teaches. Okay. Um, weep with them that weep. Weep with them that weep. Someone's broken hearted. One of the hardest things in the world for them is to have people not empathize. It's funny, I, I realized this a couple of years ago. I didn't realize um, how important it was that you be with somebody when they're going through a hard time. But I really realized it when I watched my P 
parents lose their daughter. I lost my sister. But I watched my parents lose their daughter, which is, you know, a sort of a contradiction of the way that we think life should be. And I watched how much it mattered to them who came to our celebration service of her home going. And there were some people that were, you know, pretty close, family and so forth, that should have come, and they didn't. And here's what's funny about it. It's in their personality, particularly for my mom, to remember things like that. But here's what's funny about it. I remember too. Whereas usually I'm like, well, you know, whatever. But the, I, I just say so. I don't think anything about those people, but I remember who wasn't there. Isn't that funny? It made an impression on me who didn't care what we were going through. Just made an impression. You say, Pastor, well, you know, you know, you got to understand people have, yeah, yeah, I understand all that. I'm just telling you, it made an impression on me who didn't care. And you know, one of the things that we lack in the church is empathy. In other words, you just don't really care enough about somebody to actually cry with them. To actually be there when they're mourning. It's amazing how much of a difference it makes in someone's life not to have you do something, but to have you be there when you ought to be there. I believe it's helped me in my ministry just to realize that. But it's in the Bible if you've never had an experience to teach you. The Bible says, weep with them that weep. Verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. This is interesting, isn't it? Be of the same mind one toward another. Like everybody the same. Is what it's saying. Don't be a respecter of persons. Is what it's saying. In other words, somebody comes through the door. It's one thing if you know if it's a you know a church member that's moved away and you haven't seen him in two years. If everybody wants to go say hello to him, it's amazing how that people can come in the door, and people in our church don't even know the people in our church. A lot of times I tell people, get to know people. Well, I don't have anything in common with them. And you know, that's, that statement is excluded from a qualification for this command. You ought to know people. You ought to love people. You'd get over yourself if you'd be all about other people. In other words, I don't have to have something in common with someone in order to reach out to them, to know what's going on in their life, to care about them, to pray for them, and to let them know that they matter. And this is very practical here. You know something? I've watched some people in our church in this last year begin to grow in this area, but this is a real problem in our church right now. A real problem in our church right now is that sometimes people can be missing from being part of the body. And it doesn't occur to people for like a month. And then when they say, you know that person, you know there's... And they try to describe the person to me because they don't know their name. They're not here. You know, where have they been? And I just think, they moved away a year ago. And you just now notice they were missing. <laughs> they didn't matter much to you. And the reason? It's because they didn't matter much to you. As believers, if we're going to live the doctrine, the things that Paul has taught all the way, all this doctrine about salvation, how the Jews are saved, how to have spiritual victory, faith, and so forth, then everyone ought to matter. And the Bible says, be of the same mind one toward another. So I ought to think the same way about Charlie and his importance as I think about Andrew and his importance. Or Devin, who's my son. Everybody's kind of fond of their son, aren't they? And Joel, who's not quite my son. Uh, so the idea is, is, if he's invited, he ought to be invited. Right? If we're going to do something together, then we should do something. It's not that those things always work that way. But you ought to care about each other. You shouldn't just look for a person that you can connect with. That's about you. You ought to look for people that need to be connected with. And that's about everybody. And that person's everyone. You know, as a believer in a church our size, there is no excuse for our people not knowing each other, not knowing what's going on. You know what? Do you know what the people sitting on the same... Uh, row with you this morning are praying about or burdened about? Do you know what the people in this room are going through? Or do you just know what you're going through and maybe one person that you really like? It's easy to know about Miss Melissa, isn't it? Because she's nice and everybody likes her. 
You may not like Miss Melissa. I found a person one time. <laughs> and seriously, it's easy, you know, oh, we like her. You know, well, what about the person that's, you know, a little bit, a little bit uh, sharp with their tongue or not nice or maybe doesn't know what deodorant is or whatever? Uh, do you like them? And do you invest in them? The Bible says then to follow up that statement, might not high things but condescend to men of low estate. This is my problem with a church that tries to reach a particular people group or a particular social economic group. I'm always bothered by a church that tries to reach a people group. Well, you know, I've always just really, you know, I wanted to reach the deaf. Well, good, reach the deaf. Reach everybody else too. Well, you know, God's really given me a strong burden for His people, the Jews. Yeah, do you remember who Romans was written to? Jews, Jews and the Greeks. Uh, the Bible says, mind not high things. <laughs> there are believers, and I'm talking about people that are saved, they give a testimony of their salvation, that go to a church on the basis of its socioeconomic status. In other words, you know, we're kind of a upscale church. I believe a church ought to represent its neighborhood. It ought to represent the demographics of the people that are able to go there from anywhere that is within reason. It's bothersome to me when people try to reach blacks or white people or Spanish-speaking people or whatever. No, my friend, the Bible says, mind not high things. You know, there are churches that try to reach influential people. In other words, they want the people in the church, you know, it's okay to have a few bus people or you know, a few folks from a lower income neighborhood, but we need to make sure that we're reaching the right people so that we can be, you know, financially what we need to be. Mind not high things, the Bible says. And then it goes on to say, but condescend to men of low estate. Condescend to men of low estate. In other words, what it's very specifically saying is get on the level with somebody. The word for low estate is humility. Same word that's used for humility. Isn't that interesting? In other words, it isn't, well, they're not important. It's humility. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Jesus was God, and he condescended to be like men. And not just a man, Jesus was a servant of men. Mind not high things, but condescend to them of low estate. Listen, we're not from different socioeconomic classes when we're children of the king. Isn't it so? Yes. Yeah, well then you better watch out who you favor, who you feel comfortable with. And, you know, we're just different, you know? No, you're not if you're in Jesus. You're not different. We're the same. We're just the same. We're just the same. And so the Bible says, don't look to, you know, oh, there's somebody who can do something for me, or there's somebody who's impressive. I want to go, you know, mind them or think about them. The word mind is, is a word, you know, that has to do with literally the cognitive process or thinking. So the Bible says, condescend to low, men of low estates. And then it goes on to say, be not wise in your own conceits. And I absolutely love this. Because some people think they're so smart but they're not. Some people think they're so intelligent, and they are not. If we were to take an IQ test, no one here today would likely score the same as anyone else. You would all score lower than Charlie. <laughs> Joel's probably the IQ test guy, actually, in this place. He's got the IQ kind of a brain. But the reality of it is not, a, I, I'm just joking about that, but the reality is none of us would score the same on an IQ test. Why? Because we're all different. If somebody got a higher score, who made them? Or who gave them the internet so they could practice taking an IQ test? <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> the Bible says, be not wise in your own conceits. You know, sometimes I find that the most ignorant people think that they are the wisest. Sometimes people that really think that they really understand and they really know what's going on and how things should be done and they have the most counsel and the most advice to give to everybody else or the people that have the least knowledge and the least wisdom. 
And we're to be very, very, very careful about not minding high things, condescending to men of low estate, but also not to think that we're the smartest people in the world. It took me a while to realize I wasn't the smartest person in the world, mostly because it, it was years and years and years of my life before I ever met someone who was, you know, at least on my level. And so, Brother Charles looked at me like, really, did you just say that? <laughs> yeah, I just said, I'm joking, brother. Right? The reality of it is, is that, you know, different people are smart in different ways, aren't they? Aren't they? Different people are smart in different ways. I've met people that just don't seem like, you know, they're too very too smart socially. It's amazing that they've got uh, the mind is like a steel trap to remember things. Mm -hmm. Some people don't seem like they're very good, uh, you know, with mechanical things, and then all of a sudden you you find out some things that they actually are good at and understand. I can't think what they'd be if they're not good at mechanics, but they, they, it does exist. <laughs> so, anyway, my point in that this morning is that it shouldn't matter to us. We're wise in our own conceits. In other words, we think we're smart, but probably no one else does, and actually we're not. Moving forward, again, I believe that these are behaviors toward the lost, primarily. Recompense no man evil for evil. Well, this is a tough one for a price. I believe that there is something special written into the DNA and the genetic code of prices people that are from the price family and then we got an extra strand of the same dna when my mom who's a felman married into the price family that helps you to really understand the concept of vengeance and how to get people let me just tell you something wake you up yesterday you know it was april fool's day i'm, I'm not kidding it was okay <laughs> yesterday was april fool's day and my brother got got us all he got all the immediate family pretty well. He got an app on his cell phone that made it so that you could take a picture of a car and then it looked like the windows were shot out of it. And you know my dad has semi-trucks, tractors, car, probably 50, 60 vehicles around the farm. And he went and took pictures of a bunch of them with the windows all shot out of them and sent it to my mom. Oh. And uh, so I had my parents kind of really, oh man, you know, you think about, you know, if you don't have insurance on all those vehicles, you know, you know, tractor windows and all the specialty things. You know, it could be a real mess, you know, having the windows all shot out. So I got my mom, and then my mom forwarded it to my dad and got him. And then yesterday, uh, my brother got me. He, <laughs> this is funny because I did the same thing. I got Dan Marino with a similar thing yesterday. But he posted a Craigslist ad that I would be interested in and texted it to me. And so I responded on an email, and of course, it was going through the Craigslist responder, and it was going to him. And so I made a deal to buy something. It was like at an ATM, taking money out and headed for, headed to West Palm Beach yesterday. And he called me, "What are you doing?" I'm like going to West Palm Beach. He's like, "You probably better not." I'm like, "Why?" He's like, oh, "April Fools." I'm like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> so, you know, I'm gonna get him. I'm telling you, next year, April Fools' Day. <laughs> he got me. He really got me good. The thing about it was that I was very aware that he was gonna try to get me, and then. You know, I should have just ignored phone calls and texts from him the whole day. You know, actually, it took him. He texted me once, called me once, and missed both because my phone wasn't around. So he probably thought I was ignoring him, but he still got me. Anyway, you know, it's one of those things that's, you know, funny. But I'm not getting back because it's built into our genetic code <laughs> to get vengeance. Well, the Bible says no, uh, recompense not evil for evil, and uh, then it goes on to say. Uh, than all the scriptures that are quoted. Um, oh, oh let's, let's before we get to the next to that to the point I'm about to make. Let's look, finish the rest of verse 17. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. So don't don't just do evil because someone else does evil. Be do right, honest, pure, just. These words that are affiliated or associated with it. Verse 18. This is interesting because <laughs> it's funny because it seems like the Holy Spirit gave us some latitude on this one, but actually He didn't. If it be possible. I don't know how many people say that possible things are impossible. Right? Can't be done. I don't know how many times I've heard things can't be done in my lifetime. It's like a challenge, by the way, isn't it? For people to try to get things done. Can't be done. It's impossible. Uh, well, the Bible says if it be possible, then it says, uh, as much as lieth in you, Live peaceably with all men. My friend, you do not have a limit when God is giving you grace. 
you do not have a limit when God is giving you grace. He's, he is giving you sufficient grace. And friend, you can live peaceably with all men. You can do it. You say, what if somebody is just naturally provoking me or wants war? What if somebody does? Well, if that's the honest, if that's the honest truth, then you won't be able to live peaceably with them, but it won't be because of anything that's in you. That's pretty simple, isn't it? You know, I found that you're able to have confrontation without war. Yesterday, somebody drove on my grass with a rider truck. It's drought season. The grass is suffering right now, and the weeds are attacking it. It sure doesn't need a dry rider truck, you know, cranking its wheel in the middle of it, does it? And they're disturbing my peace, because what's a rider truck doing near my house anyway? Every day, with the lift gate going up and down and banging and forklifts and stuff. I don't live in an industrial neighborhood. Well, you know, it's okay for me to have grass, isn't it? It's okay for me to try to grow it. It's doing poorly right now. Rider trucks are hard on it. It's okay, isn't it? But you're not supposed to live peaceably, aren't I? So, if I'm going to ask a guy not to drive a rider truck on my lawn, I better do it in the right way. Right? Hey, bud, I know you didn't mean to, but uh, I'm really struggling getting my grass to grow right now, and I wonder if you could just be careful about driving on it. You know, that's really not that offensive to people. Oh, I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, okay. That's all it takes. But you know, I've seen a lot of Christian men get out and say, you know, I don't know where you grew up. <laughs> <laughs> where I come from. Well, you didn't grow up reading and studying Romans chapter 12. If that's the way you speak to people. Live peaceably with all men. Okay? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Again, this one's written for me. It's a help to me. Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. You think I'm bad, but if you only knew what went on in this brain when it comes to how to get people back, I'm telling you, elaborate schemes, <laughs> things that are brilliant, that have to do with vengeance. And the Bible says, avenge not yourselves. And then it goes on to say, for it is written. Since we're here, since we're talking about it being written, that is, another, that is a famous occurrence of gagrapti, which in the tense means it has been written, it is written, it will be written. It means all of those. And it, the word, it is written, the gagrapti from which those three words are derived, it is written. It's very interesting because those words imply that God's Word is eternal. That is, it always has been, it is, and it always will be. It's a pretty interesting study. And so God's never changed about that whole vengeance thing. You say, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's what man says. That isn't what God says. God says, I'm going to repay. Vengeance is mine. I'm the one that vengeance is for. You're playing God when you try to avenge yourself. Let God avenge you. Go ahead and let God do it. And that's always been true. That's not something that's New Testament. Well, God's changed. You know, now Jesus is love. You know, no, my friend, God's always been that way. He's a righteous, holy, just judge. Speaking of, uh, it is written. This is interesting. If you were in Sunday school class this morning, you heard Ken Ham uh, give an answer about the Word of God and about the fact that, how did he phrase it? You God's. Have to take it you have to take it naturally. Some place it needs to be taken naturally. In other words, it's cultural or whatever. That's what he was saying. And he mentioned that Proverbs actually is uh, poetry. Proverbs is poetry, which is to imply that it's not that it is not full of commands and that it's not inspired as scripture. Or it's a different it's a different kind of scripture. You know, poetry is just it's pretty. You know, it's prose. It's clever, if you will, but not. It's God's Word and it is true. It's always true. By the way, the same people that believe that are the same people that attack 
Proverbs 26, 2, train up a child in the way, 22, 6, right? Yeah. I say I always mix those numbers. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go when he's old and not depart from it. All kinds of people excuse the way their children grow up, ex assuming that God's wrong or that, you know, doing things God's way didn't work. Instead of asking God, God, what did I do that wasn't your way? And learning, thing, doing things God's way instead. Um, but the Bible says here, uh, in verse 20, it says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt reap coals of fire on his head. This is in the same passage of Scripture. It's talking about it being written. And this is a quote of all places of Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. I ask you, if Proverbs is merely prose, why is it quoted? Why is it quoted in the Scripture? It's a pretty important question, isn't it? In other words, if it's just a good idea, then what kind of weight or bearing does it have to quote it in Romans, which is purely doctrinal? It's an important question, isn't it? So what did God intend when He gave us Proverbs? He gave us His Word. That's what He gave us. And his word is quoted in his word. And I'm not going to be mean this morning. We're actually going to teach a Sunday school series in the near future on why we use the King James Version of the Bible. But you know if you don't use in the English language the King James Version of the Bible, you use a version of the Bible that doesn't believe that all Scripture, just doesn't believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. They don't believe in preservation of the Scripture. And they don't believe in the authority of the Scripture. And it was amazing to me how Ken Ham literally cut the carpet pulled the rug out from under his own feet and answering a man who was debating creation by saying, well, you know, the Word of God, you know, some of it, you know, is very, very inspired and accurate. Some of it, you know, is, you know, poetry. To which the question is, how do you decide what's, this is, thus saith the Lord, and this is very nicely written. How do you decide between that? Well, you don't. Either it's all or it's not. If you're going to be honest about it, you don't want to get on a slippery slope. Use the right Bible. And you say, if you have questions about that, you could go to one of our series, which is online on YouTube, on why we use the King James Version of the Bible. This is not meant to be an attack this morning, but I think if you were to take the time and invest yourself in studying that, you would come to a good conclusion about the same. So, it's an important question. Okay, now I want to finish this morning by uh, just reading verse 21, and this is not the end of this passage because we're going to see ultimately how to behave toward authority. The Bible says in verse 21, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't succumb. Don't cave. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't be overcome of evil. You know, some Christians succumb, don't they? I think the place where believers are overcome with evil the most is in the marriage relationship. As a pastor, it breaks my heart to see a husband or a wife, one or the other, taking a biblical scriptural position and having a spouse oppose them. And it seems as though the wife or the husband always give in to the one who is doing evil or wants evil or is on the evil team the GOAT team, if you will. I've seen many times where a husband says, well, you know what, I'm okay with you worshiping God, but I just don't want you know, our family you know, to be in church all the time. And I've seen the wife stop going all the time. Well, I, you know, I've seen wives who say to the husband, well, you know something, I am not going to you know, just do every little thing that the Bible says. And I've seen husbands just kind of I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do battle all the time. Well, the Bible says, though, that we ought to earnestly contend for the faith. And so, if you're not in a relationship, let me just say to you, don't get in a relationship that would be a battle all the time. But if you are in a relationship, my friend, love your spouse, behave the way the Word of God says you ought to behave toward a spouse, but don't give up on good. If it's good, hold the line, hold on to it. Don't give up on good. Be not overcome of evil. Listen, you give up of good, then you're overcome by evil. It's amazing watching children destroyed because of Christian, in many cases, spouses who can't agree 
or won't submit to good. I watch it in music. I watch it in education. I watch kids destroyed because maybe a husband and wife don't agree about good, godly Christian music. And so guess what the kids go with? They don't go with the good music. They go with the ungodly music. Watch them about education. Well, I don't want my kids to be weird. I don't want to have a Christian education. I don't want blah, 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 blah. And they end up being destroyed, having their minds literally brainwashed by people that oppose good. I'm not saying there ought to be argument and fighting in the home. I'm saying you ought to stand for right. You ought to hold to right. Be not overcome of evil, but the Bible says overcome evil with good. And here's what I found. I found that good is oftentimes compromised. In other words, you may be right about this thing, but you maybe uh, are not gracious or you're not right about something else. And the way to overcome evil with good is to be good. And the idea of good, the very word carries with the idea of whole or wholesomeness, which means that it is not partly partially good and partly evil. But literally, a person who is overcoming evil with good tries to be good in every way. And something's pointed out in your life that's inconsistent with good, then you get make that thing good. And you'll overcome evil that way. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Sometimes Christians lose the battle of peer pressure. I think peer pressure is pretty strong when you're a teenager. But I know adults who can't do anything without knowing whether or not it'll be acceptable to their peers. I get so tired of, of Facebook posts being, what do you think about, you know, I'm not picking on you or anybody else if you ever ask people's advice on Facebook. I'm just thinking, you know something, are all of your friends good counselors? Just ask the ones that are then. Don't ask everybody about everything. Does everybody love the Lord? Don't ask people who don't love the Lord what they think. Mm -hmm. Serious. Mm -hmm. Don't ask people who don't love the Lord what they think. They're going to tell you what the world thinks. And then you're going to feel badly for not going with their advice. Find out what God's Word says. And if you can't figure out what God's Word says, find out somebody that knows God's Word better than you do. Find out what they think. Overcome evil with good. Oftentimes we're, we're peer-oriented so much so that there are people that do things they disagree with that they don't like or they wouldn't do, but they're so worried about what people think about it. And I'm just telling you something. It's not just kids. We talk about peer pressure. We think teenagers. Not so. Not so. It's amazing what people do because of the way people think about them. And as believers, we're just not to be overcome of evil. Not be overcome of evil. But we are to overcome evil with good. God help us to have the kind of mentality that says, I won't shut up. I know shut up's not a nice word, but I'm not going to do it. I won't be silenced. If they're going to do evil, they're going to do it with the knowledge that it's evil. I have to, on a pretty fairly basis, fairly often basis, tell people when they say, well, pastor, I've already decided. I have to say, you may have already decided, but I, I, I am obligated by God to open His Word. I still got to show you that it's wrong. I want you to know when you do it that you know it's wrong, and I want you to know that I told you so. Because I don't want to be blood guilty. And I want you to know that, you know, every time you see me, you'll be reminded. <laughs> when I counsel young couples that are going through premarital counseling, first thing we ever agree on is what the Word of God says about the permanence of marriage. One of the things I tell them is if you ever get divorced, I'll visit you, and I'll call you a liar. Not because I'm trying to be mean or cruel or vindictive, but because that's what you are if you make a covenant with God and you break it. 
and you'll have lied to the witnesses. I, and I tell them, I'll try to get everybody who's at your wedding who, when we say we're gathered together in the sight of God and these witnesses, I'll try to get the witnesses. Well, I'll come see you. Why is that? Well, because I want good to overcome evil. I don't want evil to overcome good. In other words, we're supposed to be the peers that pressure people to be godly, to do things God's way. We're not supposed to succumb to the pressure. You say, Pastor, isn't there a place for grace in that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't there a place for forgiveness? Yeah, God forgives. No question about that. My friend, it's amazing how many times we as believers are silenced. We've been silenced about holding up the Word of God and making an issue out of the inspiration and preservation of the Scripture. We've been silenced oftentimes about holding up the matter of faithfulness. We've been silenced many times and about you can name just about anything that the culture and the society is against, which is against God. And my friend, that's not the influence the church is supposed to have. That's not the description that Jesus gave when He said about the church that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. And our witness, our testimony as believers, hey, we don't need to be high-minded. It's wrong. We need to condescend to people. That's right. We don't need uh, to be uh, unkind or ungracious or vengeful. I'll tell you what we need to do is we need to be holy. We need to we need to exercise that which we believe to be true in the Scripture and not be silenced in it. And as believers, there ought to be a characteristic balance. As much as in us, we ought to do it all peaceably, right? Live peaceably with all men. Peacemakers. Is that you? Do these biblical scriptural commands describe you? Are you living out the application of probably one of the most practical Scriptures, passages of Scripture in the Word of God that teaches you how to act as a believer in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for what you've taught us this morning. We ask that you would help us with the practical application of it. We pray in Jesus' name. I don't know what God may have spoken to you about in specific this morning, specifically this morning. I do know this. I, I know that it's not natural for us bless those that persecute us. It's not natural for us to not take vengeance. It's not natural for us to stand uh, when those uh, when those that are around us are not standing or when many people have succumbed to evil. I want to sing actually this morning uh, a song a little different for an invitation, but page 228, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. I want to ask you the question if, if of whether or not from God's Word you're convinced that these things are true regardless of what it is that you've always thought. And there's a question isn't the question is not is this possible? The question is, is it true? And the question is, should I then agree with God in his word? And if that's so, then could you just rest your faith in it? Could you just say, God, I'm gonna believe you at your word? Let's sing page two twenty eight. If you'd stand to your feet physically, we're gonna have a time where we're gonna sing it. It's gonna be our invitation song this morning. If God spoke in your heart, feel free to kneel or bow or respond to God, even as you're standing by silently praying, God, yes, Lord, I'm going to take what I've learned in your word, I'm going to, I'm going to take it, I'm going to apply it, and I'm going to live it in my life. My faith has found a resting place. Let's sing it.